Welcome back, everybody, to the Thrive Street Podcast, Mastering the Art of Thriving at Life, where we talk about creating change in our lives and in the world around us. I'm your host, JJ. This is my co-host, Gigi. Say hi, Gigi. Hi. And uh, today we're going to go over uh, kind of this, this uh, Venn diagram I created as, as one of the things that, that, that was in my head for the longest time as I've been creating programming for as long as I have. So we're going to talk a little bit more about programming and kind of how I view um, a good general physical preparedness program and how it fits into the, the, you know, your greater life. And then uh, we're going to talk about this really interesting article that uh, um, Gigi found. They call it a study, but I don't know if it's, it, it hasn't been published in any journals and it was actually funded or, or done by a, a music uh, company that does venues. So it's <laughs> a little bit of a grain of salt. But it said that, that their research has found that, um, that, Going to going to music gigs, going to concerts and, and things is actually shown to, to improve well-being more than something like yoga or even walking dogs. But my question is, is does it? What about if you were doing yoga while you were walking your dog? Could it be better? <laughs> <laughs> find so out. <laughs> to, stay tuned to find out more. Um, but yeah, so so let's jump into this. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. Can you see this, Gigi? Mm, I see Jeremy Jones has started. Yes, I can see it. Look at that Venn diagram, all those colors. So nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't see our cameras. There you go. I like that boring CrossFit. <laughs> <It's one laughs> of well, yeah. So, so for those of you guys who are listening in, it's uh, four bubbles. And the, the four bubbles are the, the, and they're not in any particular order, but they basically has one is strength, one is cardio, one is play, and then one is skill. And, and I could, I could make this thing three-dimensional, add more bubbles and make it far more complicated, or we could pick four other things to sort of compare. But for those of you guys who, who aren't familiar, Venn diagrams are, you, you know, like the simplest one is two circles and they overlap. And so you kind of have, you know, one circle might be characteristics of one thing and then characteristics of another. And then where they overlap is where the things they have in common. And so what, you know, I have this one, these four that are overlapping and it's kind of how I think about, um, the human, the human animal, the human body and, and, and the things that we're doing, um, um, with our, with ourselves, not just in the gym, but how we would use them outside of the gym, you know? So for a pure strength example, there's, there's power lifting, um, for a pure skill, it might be something like golf or yoga. Um, uh, you know, the, the play examples I have like dancing and softball and kind of recreational sports. And then cardio would be like running and spin. Right. So, so those are pretty, pretty obvious examples. And then, you know, you start thinking about some of the overlap. So, you know, what about, you know, um, Olympic weightlifting or strongman? Why well, I, I feel like that's kind of overlapping skill and strength um, uh, because there's a lot more skill required um, in general for things like uh, Olympic weightlifting and, and strongman. Um, and the same thing for like skill and play, you know, might be skiing or skateboarding or rock climbing, you know, yeah, there's, there's strength involved in that, but that's not really the primary domain that, that we're training, you know, each, each one of these sort of things, it's not like it's a perfect, but it's just kind of, kind of placing it around the circle. Then of course, play and cardio would be like Zumba or maybe even like a boot camp. It has a lot of fun in it. And then strength and cardio, we see kind of the tip bodybuilding or typical gym training where people use the machines or do a little bit of weightlifting and then, and then do their cardio training. And then we start getting closer and closer. And right in the center is, is where I kind of want Thrivestry to live, where we, where we do all these things sort of in balance. You know? But if you were to take the three things, cardio, strength, and skill, you would get this, like uh, Gigi was laughing at this boring CrossFit. This would be training alone or doing a real strict competition program. You're going to make sure that you're doing all of those three domains, you know, uh, 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 pretty much every day, but there's not a lot of fun to it, right? It's, it's, it can be monotonous. It can be, um, you know, uh, just more of a drag because you're not really necessarily doing it with a lot of other people. Um, if you were to just think about strength, cardio, and play, that's kind of like what, where I see uncoached CrossFit, you know, where, where people who are, who are, um, uh, doing it on their own. So those of you guys who train by yourselves, you know, and you're not necessarily being taught or really trying to advance your skill levels very much. You're just, you know, you do a lift, you know, you do Metcons, um, uh, you know, you, you, uh, or, you know, you might be having fun with it. You know, you might be, you know, playing around with it or, com or comparing, maybe you're working out with friends, but you don't have somebody teaching you more advanced skills. Um, uh, and then on the other side of the spectrum, strength, skill, and play, I'd put gymnastics. Right, so gymnastics is is a strength 
sport. You know, it's, it, people think of it as body weight, but the, but because of the mechanical things that they're doing, the leverage that they're doing, it's, it's extremely uh, a strength domain sport. You just look at the, the average competitive gymnast, you can see how strong they are by looking at them. And then something like cardio skill and play might be martial arts or just doing Metcon without doing the strength stuff. And then of course, right here in the middle, smack dab, covering all bases is Thrive of Street. And, and uh, really what, we're, what, we're, what I'm trying to do is make sure that we, we, we're working towards strength. And strength is one of those domains that we wanna train, that takes years and years to, to really develop and can, can, we can continue to develop for a very long time. Um, it, you know, for 10, 20, 30 years, we can continue to develop different modes of strength. Um, and the same thing goes for, for skill. Skill is something that never, that never ends. You know, you think about playing a musical instrument or something very technical like a golf swing, you know, those things, you know, we can work on for the rest of our lives to try to improve. Um, you know, and then the play factor, you know, I, I make sure that we're, that we're, you know, the workouts have funny names or that we're, you know, we're, I'm changing up some of the rules of the workouts so that, so that it's a little bit more interesting than just doing five rounds for time. Um, I also do a lot of teamwork workouts. Um, you know, even, even just sort of sometimes we're, we're doing skill work, but it's more of a play environment where we're going to be playing around with new, new variations of the movements or, or, uh, or different progressions. And then, um, of course, you know, the cardiovascular component is when we're doing our Metcons, right? We are, we're working those, those time domains. I'm making sure it's included. And the reason why I try to incorporate all this stuff, and this goes back to what Thrivestry is all about, is, is if you, now if you look at this if, if from the inside out, you look at all these things I mentioned, powerlifting and Zumba and skiing and golf and all these things. If you have a good general physical preparedness program, it's going to allow you to go in any one of these directions. You know, so if you decide that you wanted to, uh, you know, your friend invites you to play golf and you haven't played golf before, or you haven't done it in many years, or, or you have this opportunity to do a spin class and you, you haven't done it before, you know, it, you're, you're, you're going to go and, you know, you're going to be able to perform well, you know, you're going to be okay. able to enjoy all right. it. All right. Let's not get carried away that you golf is not like riding a bike. You don't just get this. I'm just going to say no. <laughs> to that. So, so what I mean, what I mean is Example of golf. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. So what I mean is, is that you can participate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. with a good general physical preparedness program, you can participate in any of these activities when the opportunities come up. And if you, if you, uh, you know, if, if you were strict, just a runner and you could try to do golf, but you, you would probably struggle more than somebody who had a little bit more, you know, flexibility and a little bit more, uh, attention to, to, uh, skills and learning movements, um, where you can, you can pick things up faster when you're constantly trying to learn new movements, you know? And, and so it, like I said, it gives you, it gives you the most options, you know? So, so that's the thing when you think about general physical preparedness and you think about something like CrossFit, it, it's really about. Um, kind of, again, being able to, you know, uh, take advantage of these opportunities when they come up, you know, if someone said, Hey, I want to go, I want to go on this long hike, you know, you're going to, you're going to be able to keep up, you know, now if this person's like a, you know, a professional hiker or somebody who does it all the time, yeah, they're going to, they're going to have to slow down for you. But if you never do any, any of that sort of training, um, then you're going to, you're going to struggle a lot more and not have as much fun. Um, uh, so you might miss those opportunities. You know, another one might be, uh, uh, you know, wakeboarding or, you know, you know, skiing or something like that, you know, and then sometimes there's, there's times when you need it, like in an emergency, like you got to run to catch the next plane. You got to, you know, you got to, um, uh, you do something that's, that's urgent. And, you know, if, if you haven't, if you don't have this general physical base, this foundation to build on, you know, you may, you can, you may miss out or something bad could happen because you couldn't, because you couldn't do it. I do want to add two. First of all, I love this. I think this is amazing. I love that you put it together. It really is like, I would love to see this get shared everywhere. And for those of you that are just listening to this, I would say do yourselves a favor and look up this diagram, this lovely Venn diagram with all the pretty colors so that you can uh, really and truly understand it because it, it does encapsulate all of the different ways that we incorporate movement. Or we should be incorporating movement into our everyday lives. Um, and, and I will attest that Thrive Street is the middle of all of that. Um, even though this is the Thrive Street podcast, it is true. <laughs> I know, it's, it, it, it like sounds like pulling teeth when you say that. You're like, oh God, I, yes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it really is. Um, but I, so I have a question and then I have a, a psychological comment uh, that I want to discuss as well. So when did you 
cardio strength skill, like those are pretty normal things when people think of fitness, right? Like cardio is definitely a thing. People understand that, yes, you need to be strong. And then, you know, there's this sense of like, okay, I understand that practice is an important thing too. How did you realize, like, what was your thought process when you were kind of working this out in your head that you needed to have play as an integral piece of movement? You know, it's, there's, there's the book, um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is a really good one. And it, and it was a book that talks a lot about um, play has been part of human, human play is an integral part of society, right? And, and it's, you know, it's simple, small games to just learning new things and being able to be experiment and try different things. And, and I think that, you know, hobbies and playing is something that everyone should have. Um, as part of their, as part of their lives. And, you know, after running the gym for so long, you know, like, again, I tell people like I could probably make the, the Thrive Street gym programming a tiny bit better, maybe a few percent better um, than it is now, but it, it might start to, we might start to approach that monotony and it, it would just be a drag. Right. And, and, and uh, for those of you guys who do the competition stuff, it is a lot of work and it is not fun. Like that is not, that is not the main focus for people who are trying to get really good in the competitive side. Um, but for regular people, if we can incorporate more fun into the classes, then we, we counteract the, 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 again, the drudgery that comes with just showing up and, and going to the gym. If we can make parts of it where we laugh and we have a good time while we're getting cardiovascular benefits and strength benefits and skill benefits, you know, while we're sort of eating our vegetables, you know, that's going to keep people around for a long time. And that was, and it, you know, even going back to, you know, when I was running the gyms years and years ago, you know, that's what we realize is that is that having some sort of play and fun aspect, you know, now some people don't like a lot of that in the class, but most of them aren't going to quit the gym because you had you played a fun warm up game, you know, or or because the, you know, it was a team workout and, and it was like fun to pair up with people, you know, and, and they're like, oh, I just want to come in and do work, you know, most yeah, people. Yeah. Haters gonna hate, man. Like, what are you gonna do? Right? Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, even if they really don't like it, and it kind of, you might get an eye roll out of it. But as long as you're providing the results on the rest of it, it's not gonna be like a, a make or a break kind of a kind of a deal. Yeah, um, everyone needs to kind of. <clears throat> I think one of the problems in a specifically a CrossFit gym is that people just take it way too seriously, and <clears throat> you just gotta lighten up, right? Like everything. Yeah. Don't take it so seriously. Don't you know? Just chill the fuck out. Learn well, to have and you know and part of it too you know, over the top but enjoy it there's nothing wrong with having fun right yeah and that's that's one of the reasons why i'm i'm a big proponent of of getting people to do activities with their fitness outside of the gym you know whether it's a spartan race or like a fun local competition or something you know you know like a like a fundraiser you know where you do laps or you know what i mean like all those those are kind of fun opportunities to use your fitness outside of the gym because even if you love coming and seeing the people and you have these great results. If you're if you're still just all you do is work and gym and and you know family, but you don't ever actually like go like get to use and show off and 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 remind yourself why you're putting in all this time and effort. It can be it can be hard sometimes when you know life happens and and you have to change move things around to make time for the gym. But if you're constantly using it and you and, it, and it's like oh I'm, I, this is great I get to do this this all this cool stuff, then it then it's that's kind of that that play factor as well. Right. Um, right. So that's the, <clears throat> sorry, um, that's the, the psychological aspect is that by doing all of these things and by incorporating all of these elements on a regular basis in your day-to-day -day life, you're encouraging within yourself a growth mindset, mi mindset when it comes to trying new things, being able to do new stuff. So it's not just like you're physically comfortable with going for a hike or going to play golf when you haven't played in 15 years since you went to golf camp for five years and then you have to do it with your work friends and you look silly. <laughs> um, but it, it's not just like you're physically able to do it. It's that you are mentally comfortable with putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Yes. Right? If you're not always used to challenging yourself and trying new things, that when the opportunity comes to try new things, you might not necessarily do it, right? Like wakeboarding is something that I never did until the first time a couple years ago. Um, and I snowboard and I am a really good swimmer and there's no reason why I had never done it. It had just never come up, right? And I suck at it. But now every summer when the opportunity comes up, it's like, yep, yeah, I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna try. And you know, you try, you wipe out a few, whole bunch of times and then, and then that's it, right? Like, and that's, it's not really 
that fun because it's kind of uncomfortable. But when <laughs> cause you're just being smacked on the water all the time, yeah. but when you get that, that second or two or that 10 seconds or that 30 seconds where you're really enjoying yourself and you're really doing it well, then it's all worth it, right? And, and you wouldn't have the type of mindset to be able to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail um, if you weren't regularly doing that in your everyday life and regularly trying new things and trying it on and not doing well and trying it on and not doing well. Um, and it's, it, so it's not just the physical side. It is that, that growth mindset too, right? Of, oh, it's, and you, 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 you said it. I mean, being in kind of an interesting perspective of where I was, you know, I was living and breathing the, the gym and, and all my friends and everything were all gym people. And, you know, my schedule was packed with events and you start hanging out with these people and you start to get a little insulated. This is very true for you guys listening that are, that are gym owners or who are coaches or even people who, whose whole community revolves around the gym. You start to get a little bit disconnected from your other friends because, because they don't have that mindset, you know, and you're like, Hey, let's go, let's go do this. And they're like, no, no, no. And nobody wants to do it. And I, and I do think there's that that's part of the, of what happened with the whole growth of CrossFit and all the community stuff is that you start getting these people together and, you know, even the newer people are still a little timid, but all their friends are like, you know, they do it and they fail. And then like, why don't you do it too? And like, okay, I guess it's, it's okay to fail. It's okay to look foolish and try something different because we do it every day in the gym. And, and then they, they come out and then they, and then they may love it. They may really enjoy it. And, and um, because they have this community of people, that's why those communities are so strong. That's why um, they really do impact the, the greater community around them with community events and they're just better people in general because, you know, they may not have started off like that, but over time they develop this sort of growth mindset and this experimentation mindset that we don't see in just your, your regular, regular folks. And, and I think it's really important to remember that as, as you guys get stuck in this community and you're trying to attract new people, sometimes you, you get so plugged into that, you don't realize how unique that is. You yeah. Know? Right. And, and just, putting yourself out there. And you said something there. Um, you said the impact that it has on the community around you. And I think that a lot of gym owners um, overlook that part. And I, I'm talking about specifically the application of the use of a strong community. So you, you built this incredible community. You have all these people with this amazing growth mindset. How do you use that to give back to the community that the gym is in, right? Like there's so many different ways you could do it. You could have fundraisers, you could host barbecues, you could do like community fun days, right? And I'm not talking about ways to attract more clients to your gym. I'm talking about taking that, that mindset and putting it out there to the world, right? And, and constantly just improving that your community around you. And then more people will come to your gym as like a, you know, indirect, right? So, um, yeah, it there's, there's kind of a of karma it. benefit to it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not really that, but it's more, I guess you, yeah, if you want to oversimplify it and call it a karma benefit, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more like if everyone knows that you're the guys that like, you know, you raised $25,000 for the local school and now, you know, all of the kids have access to computers. Like that's huge, you know, and that, that's the kind of stuff that only people with that type of mindset can accomplish because everybody else would dream up something like that and be like, no, I couldn't do that. Or, or I really wish we could, but then they wouldn't try and they wouldn't actually do it. Right. So the amount of stuff that people with the growth mindset can actually accomplish is mind boggling. They're the people that get, get, get stuff done. Right. And, and exposing yourself, like if you're not there yet, or if you think you want to, or you're not really sure how to have a growth mindset or what to do with it, this is a really good fucking place to start, right? Like doing the Thrive Issue programming, hitting all four of these different things. Um, it's pretty cool. Like, again, I will encourage you to actually look up this diagram. And Jay, you're going to have to post it like in a bunch of different places so that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, obviously this is going to be on the YouTube video that we yeah. upload. And then um, I'll probably share it on Instagram and everything else. So pretty soon. Right now it's only been put in the private side for the subscribers. Um, so it's, there's, and there's an article going along with it where I call it the, uh, um, the, you know, the EDC, the everyday carry general physical preparedness and Marie Kondo of your sort of how you look at your training is a whole article about that. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and part of what that article says, and I know we've talked about it before is, you know, I'm, I love multi-tools and, and I think of fitness like this multi-tool and, you know, you could try to like really focus on your Olympic weightlifting and then really work on your running and then really, and, but that's like, that's like trying to like, drag around a huge toolbox with you everywhere you go just in case you need it 
and it's and it's very expensive and time consuming and energy intensive where where if you can you know with the right general physical preparedness program it's not the best tool you know like you said you can't go you're not going to win the golf if you haven't played golf but you're you're going to be able to have more fun because you know you're only going to be limited by your lack of skill not your your flexibility your strength your bad back or you know whatever you can still go participate and enjoy or just having a bad attitude right mm-hmm. like if you're like oh we're gonna go play golf i fucking hate golf i haven't golfed in in a decade and i suck at it and you go out there and you're like every ball you hit is like yeah i'm fucking terrible like that just sucks like that's not fun for anyone you know your other option is like so you go out and complain or you stay home and you do nothing right mm-hmm. neither one of those are good options you can have the exact same lack of skill and the exact same performance and enjoy yourself because you know that your physical ability on the golf course is not related to who you are as a human being. And I think that that that's ultimately like one of the most important things that people get out of this is, is understanding that the things that you can do are not who you are. Right. And, and you can do all of these things and you can try all of these things and your success and failure at any one of these things, it really has nothing to do with who you are. Yeah, yeah. And one of the important recipes or pieces of the recipe to that is those people around you that are doing that themselves and encouraging each other. You know, we, we've talked about this before is that shared vulnerability is, is an important thing for building kind of connection. And, you know, that's why these really hard workouts tend to build strong communities is because people are, they're going hard. It doesn't matter if you're really fit, you're still going to be just as tired at the end as somebody who, who's just starting out and had to go a lot slower. But at the end, you're, you know, you're both high fiving because you survived this thing. And, you exposed your, your vulnerabilities, if you will. And so that carries over to other, other parts of your life. And like I said, I'm kind of in an, in an interesting position now because I'm not in the gyms, you know, anymore. And, and so, you know, I have a lot, I'm, you know, reconnecting with a lot of my other friends and a lot of my friends that were at the gym have kind of moved on or whatever, and I'm still friends with them. And, and you start to see this, this difference between those people and the people, the rest of the world. And it's, it's, you know, it's fascinating. My, my wife and her girlfriends have started their own charity. They're all friends from the gym. You know, a few of them are still at one of the gyms I used to own, but most of them are just, they're just, they've just built these really close relationships and they, they do multiple charities a year where they set up a fundraiser and they actually will raise money for, for something local that that they do because that's who they are now, you know, from, from training, from training at the gym together for so long. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of something I want to talk about today. And it's, it, you know, it, it was, it's just a way, it's something that's been in my head for, for a really long time. I think I, I showed you a draft of this probably three or four years ago. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember, it was done on word. <laughs> oh, Thrivist Tree spelt, still spelt wrong on it. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it was thri- Thrivist, Thrive History with an I instead of an E. Uh, um, but it was, it was, uh, and, and again, it, bringing, the, bringing the play into it, I think is, is one of the, is one of the things that makes it makes it sustainable for, for the long term, you know? Um, cool. Let's, um, let's take a look at this article that you, this awesome article you found. This is another GG article. Um, and, and it's very, uh, let's see, is this it? Yeah. Um, oh, this is something different. These are, I was looking up other articles that are kind of corroborated with it, but uh, attending live concerts increases life expectancy, improves well-being more than yoga, dog walking study finds. And I'm going to a concert this week. So, <laughs> so I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to increase my life expectancy by going to a concert. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, the Bottle Rock is a, is a three-day festival in Napa. I'm just going to go for, for one day. I'm not a huge uh, – Gigi's a big concert person. I am not. Oh, I love them. I, and I'll, I'll tell you why I love them, if I may. There is something about performance art that is so – it demands you to be present and mindful. And that's what I love the most about it. Um, because if you're, if you're either watching a ballet or in taking like sitting and attending a live theater performance or watching live music, which to me are like the big performance arts. Like there's certainly a lot of, you know, you go to the park and there's the, the buskers doing the performance art and there's lots of opportunities to do that. But the thing is, is that at that point in time, that art will, will never cease to exist again which to me is is so profound like when you sit there and you watch a concert that is the only time that that music will ever exist and and even if it's a recording after you're still only listening to a recording which doesn't capture everything 
the flow and the and the vibrations and because music is just a series of vibrations that's all it is and if you are are sharing the space of the music being created you're not only sharing it in terms of like the auditory stimulus but you're also like you're you're absorbing the the vibrations right which is like just incredible to me right and so <laughs> well i mean i mean my brain's going right now and what you're talking about but the the um the, this is why they sing in church right is is actually getting people to, to do music especially in unison with lots of other people tends to kind of create connections like not you know maybe stuff they haven't studied yet but definitely within um, within certain uh, uh, neurotransmitters and things that help build connection. Um, having people move in unison, like in martial arts classes where everyone's lined up in rows and they're moving in synchronized fashion um, does kind of create um, a, a sense of unity, um, uh, marching and things in the military. Uh, th so that there, this is not, this is not like, a, a, like a unique phenomenon. We see it across other, other domains for sure. And, and so that's, that's actually why like in, in warmups and things, you know, I have these, we do these barbell complexes pretty often in the warmups and, you know, it might be three sets of five with empty bar and you're going to do a couple. And I'm, I'm trying to incorporate some additional skill work, but I, what I recommend in my videos, I say, you know, you should have everyone doing this together. So everyone does every rep at the same time, all in unison. And it does kind of make the class feel more unified versus kind of everyone kind of doing their own thing and kind of in their own little bubble you know, kind of trying to say, stay synchronized with everybody does, does help kind of build that, that, um, that, uh, mentality. But the, one other thing that jumped out at me when you were talking was, was that, uh, there was, it was, it was a, a opinion piece, but it was interesting because the person was talking about filming their daughter at the talent show. And I think she sang a song and she did okay. And, and, but, but you could just tell that she was like loving the fact being in front of everybody and singing her, her thing. And, and, uh, you know, she, she, you know, right afterward, she wanted to see her performance. And so they showed, you know, they showed her the recording and she didn't, she realized that she didn't, wasn't as cool as she thought she was. <laughs> and so it kind of ruins the experience, you know, and, and it changed. And they've even said that actually seeing a video of yourself right after something changes your perspective of you being the person facing out versus seeing yourself from the third person. It actually changes your memory of the event. So not being present. So like, like you said, like being present in the moment and enjoying all the sensory perception is very different than watching a recording of it later. And that can actually change your experience with it. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's not, wasn't really the angle that I was thinking, but that is certainly is true. Like I can tell you as an athlete, like it definitely, you know, thinking that you had a really good race and then after watching it like the the subjective your feelings analysis of it is removed right and then you're like well my flip turn could have been better and my dive could have been a lot cleaner and i was sloppy on the butterfly and you know um but if you hadn't watched that video you'd be like yeah i felt good well and it kind of depends on your goals so like you know i i do think one of the another one of the things that made the sport of cross or the fitness side sport side um excel was because of the internet and the ease of sharing videos and people started videoing themselves and, you know, your perception of how, you know, like, oh, I went so hard, I didn't rest at all. Then you watch the video and you see how much you got chalk, you know, or, or how, how sloppy your pull-ups were. And then you realize, I need to go fix these. So you can use it as an analysis tool for, like, training, but, but, uh, um, but especially from a performance-based thing where not, not physical performance, but, like, a, a musical performance or dance or something else, you know, like, maybe you don't want to see it. Or not until later. They say you can wait, you know, weeks or whatever, and then it, then it doesn't change the memory because it's, you know, concrete, the actual experience. Um, but you mentioned sports, and, and that's another thing, too, with the live being present in the moment is that live sports are far more um, popular and entertaining than watching things recorded. People want to... They want to be, live in the moment and the excitement and see it all happen when it goes down. And, and if they can be around the crowd, it's, it's much more exciting to be at the event or at a bar when it's happening live and the whole, the whole place is, is watching it and cheering or booing or whatever. You know, it's always more fun when you, when you, when you have that experience. Um, you know, the thing with live sports that's really interesting is actually it has a, it's, there's, I don't, it, you wouldn't have the same thing as a live concert. So one of the benefits of, participating in a live sport like participating and watching a live sport is the stress response mm -hmm. so it's a measured stress so it's a good stress right so we talk about good stress and bad stress and bad stress is stuff that you basically can't control you don't know when it's going to end like being stuck yeah, in traffic, chronic like that right yeah um but good stress is like i'm going to watch this game 
in three hours it will be over, right? It's going to take you through this roller coaster of emotions, like game seven with my fucking Raptors last week with a bounce in, like, holy shit. Um, I must have watched that clip a hundred times. I'm not even kidding. But that, but that stress response is, is what creates that. It's one of the major things that creates the feeling of well-being, right? Because you, you have this good stress, which you're, trains your body to have it, and you, 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 know, you release the cortisol, but in a healthy way, um, which also makes you able to handle the bad stress better. So mm-hmm. watching live sports is really important for that. Um, but I think what, it, what for me... When we're talking about live concerts, and first of all, this article, again, take it with a grain of salt because it is not, it's like, oh, it hasn't been peer reviewed and, and it was definitely paid for by a large, by a, like a Live Nation Ticketmaster type company. Um, but I think for me, it demands you to be mindful more than anything else. Like yoga, you can let your mind wander. Dog walking, you can let your mind wander. Like all of these things that are designed to be meditative. Um, you, you as a human being have to still be able to train your brain to turn off, right? So it requires a certain amount of skill, um, in order to get there, which means practice and all that kind of stuff. But I think that if you immerse yourself in the live concert experience and, and let yourself go to the point where the only thing you're paying attention to is that music then you get that meditative result without needing to practice and without needing to, to put the time that 10, 15 minutes in every single day, you can just go. And for two hours, you're lost in the moment and that's it. And that's all that there is. There's nothing else around you. This is one of the things that I do when I go to a concert. And like JJ said, I go, I go to as much and absorb as much live music as I can. And I go to symphonies and, and operas and slipknot metal right slipknot the only time jj had me speechless is after i had a i went to the justin timberlake concert and i was going on about how good it was and he's like but is it better than slipknot and i was like i I don't know (laughs) what kind of question is that like i was just like oh my god how do i answer that i don't know (laughs) but it was so because i don't even like i don't buy expensive tickets i don't sit up front I, I usually go to the back because all I want to do is listen to the music, you know, and sometimes when it's going to be a spectacle, you want to watch as well. But more than anything, it's about being present and absorbing that music in that place and time because it will never, ever exist again, um, which I think is amazing. So that's yeah. my thing. <laughs> Well, and I think, and I think too, like, like, I, I, again, kind of picking apart what's, what the research says. So just so you guys can hear it. it says those who attended concerts felt a 21% increase in well-being compared to 10% for yoga and 7% for dog walking with a, they also had a 25% increased feeling of self-worth, a 25% increased feeling of closeness to others and a 75% increased mental stimulation. So, so, you know, I mean, obviously this, that if, if this was serious, you know, they would need to do a little bit more research and everything, but you know, what are the, some of the things I, I talked about or what, what I suspect is going on is, is, again, you're sharing this unified experience with other people, right? So there's the music, there's the, the, there's the, the stimulation from the music and even the visuals. And, you know, you're, you know maybe you're dancing, you're, you know, you're, you're with this, the, the, these people and you're very present in the moment where, you know, yoga is, is a very internal, uh, internally focused practice. You know, the whole point of yoga is to focus on yourself and not be concerned about the people around you, even if they're farting. And so, <laughs> so um, it, it, even though you're, you are moving in unison, you do kind of have this sort of unifying um, thing there. You're supposed to be paying more attention to yourself and not being judgy of anybody else. And, and that, I, I do think it has a benefit. I'm not trying to bash yoga at all, but, but uh, I think it's great. I think most people should have you know, some, you know, do, doing yoga regularly is great for just about anybody. But, but uh, uh, um, the dog walking thing was a little bit disappointing, but I'm wondering if they, went, if they were dog walking outside, like, like in the nature. You know, I think, I think if this was like walking your dog down the street and you're carrying a dog poop, that's not going to be as nearly as, as, uh, um, increased feelings of self-worth or, or, uh, well-being if you're walking around the city, you know, with your dog as it is like going to a, like a beautiful park or something like that. Um, so this is, is this a thing? Like, this is the first I've heard of dog walking being like a mental health thing. Well, I think, I think it was just something that they compared to. Uh, um, but I do know that, they, I mean, there is talk of, you know, that, that when people do, they, you know, walk their dog, they, it's just walk going for a walk, 
right? right? I think it's more of just like going for a walk and spending time with this, with this um, being that relies on them for, for life and sustenance and usually gives them, you know, good feelings, right? The, the, that's what's great about dogs is they love you no matter who you are. <laughs> and so, and so I think that's part of it. That's, that's, that's part of what, what's tied in here. But, but I, you know, if there really is a, um, a, a greater increase over these other two things that compared to, I, I do think it has to do with the, the uniqueness of the experience, like you mentioned, like I said, the kind of shared um, vibrations of the music and everything else, you know, like just sharing the music and the crowd experience that you get. Um, and like, like you said, like the, the being able to put everything aside while you're there, you know, you can't really be worrying about, you know, the rest of your life when you're at a great concert. I tried to look it up. I, the, the website itself that, that, that did it, you know, um, one thing they do say is it was like regularly, like every, every two weeks going to some sort of live, you know, live uh, concert or event was what they, was what they studied. So that's pretty, that's pretty often I think for most people. Um, uh, so that's something else to keep in count. And I try to look up another study, you know, and this one did say that mental health benefits um, from going for a walk can last up to seven hours um, according to this pioneering new study, which is a total clickbait line. But, um, but then I couldn't find the actual study that they, that they did when I looked that up. Cause I was trying again, I was trying to look, com look up comparing evidence. Um, but, you know, we do know that getting outside and going for walks has been shown to help for like mental, you know, uh, men it helps mental health, it helps well being, it helps, there's all these benefits to, to that. So did you ever uh, tell you, um, walk to the concert guys, walk to dude, and then do, and then do yoga while you're there. <laughs> I tried to get my leg on camera, but it didn't, didn't go high enough. There we go. I don't know if I'd want to be that guy at the concert who's like doing yoga, like well, <laughs> while the band is playing. Anyway, I hope you have fun this weekend. We were having kind of a fun conversation offline too before we started recording about um, festivals and alcohol. <laughs> it was it was fun, and we I was just talking about how I've been to a lot of festivals where by the last guy like by the last band performing, yeah. the crowd is so fucking wasted that you don't really, you don't feel safe anymore at that point. And yeah. I, I'm kind of glad that the prices are so expensive and that they don't let people sneak stuff in and they don't sell hard liquor and stuff like that. Cause 12 hours of concert watching in the sun with drinking nothing but beer is like, that's a dangerous combination. You know, it's just, and it, especially when you're thinking of crowds of 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 people, like I wouldn't want 50,000 people drunk in the sun on my watch like that just seems like a nightmare yeah yeah i mean it's it, it's it's a recipe for bad i mean so like what i was what i was expressing was it's frustrating that they're so they don't let you bring anything in and then they charge the prices so high and they they say it's because of security and and it's not like people are smuggling in you know like i don't know like gallons of of i don't know what's what's something that not just booze but like uh GHB or whatever, <laughs> like to knock out the whole people or whatever. But, it, but, but Gigi's point was like, yeah, but you know, the problem is, is when we're in that environment and everybody's drinking and having fun and you start drinking early on, you don't really realize how much you're drinking because you're already a little bit drunk or whatever. And so then you end up drinking more and you're thirsty because it's hot and you're dancing. And then, oh, yeah. It, yeah. And then you just end up with the, the, the first aid, you know, area overflowing. I'm, I'm feeling strung out already. Just even when you're going through that saying that yeah. like you're thirsty and it's hot and you're drinking, you know, you're thirsty. So you go and get a, you know, a chug a rye instead of like a glass of water. Like you should, right? Like, yeah, yeah. we all know how potent day drunk is too, right? So that's. <laughs> yes. Yes. You guys need to always, always be careful when you're, when you're doing these live concerts, they don't mention uh, alcohol consumption in this article. I would be, I would be curious if that was because these are all short venues, but it'd be interesting that, you know, letting people relax and, and that sort of therapeutic benefit. But but in general, yeah, I would definitely say these longer concerts, it's a much, a much uh, uh, bigger issue. Um, um, again, if you just, just hang out to the last act and, and, and look, or look around yourself and you'll see how bad it can get, right? What's the next concert you're going to go to? That's a great question. You know, um, there's a whole bunch of concerts this summer that I haven't bought tickets for. Four. I have a lot of stuff kind of up in the air for my schedule, so I haven't done anything, but Slipknot is coming. So I'll probably go to that um, for like the 20th time. I'm not even kidding. It might be the 20th time that I've seen them. Um, if you guys haven't, don't know who Slipknot is, go just, just YouTube it. Oh, but don't watch their Jimmy Kimmel performance because they were awful. 
Oh, okay. Don't watch Jimmy Kimmel, but watch one of their <laughs> music videos if you want to be enlightened. <laughs> Amazing. And, and Marilyn Manson is coming too, who I've never seen. So that would be cool. Um, yeah, I was going to go see the sheepdogs, which is like, a, you know, the sheepdogs down there. They were mm -hmm. rolling down once. Anyway, um, they're, they're a Canadian band, but they're playing the Key to Bala, which is like a fun, super fun outdoor venue in cottage country. Um, I try to do one of those shows every year, but I am doing, um, I guess my next concert is uh, Symphony in the Park, which is at Casa Loma in Toronto, which is the, the castle that's in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, they have the Toronto I've been there. Stuff. Have you been there? That's fun. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it is super cool. It's really nice at Christmas, but in the summer, uh, in the gardens, they bring the Toronto Symphony Orchestra in and they play like a Midsummer's Night Dream and they play like really nice like summer stuff and you go and have cocktails and just listen to the music and be outside in the gardens, like on the grounds of the castle and it's very, very lovely. <laughs> so I guess that's my next one. I can't even tell you the last time I saw a live, live music or went specifically to a live, I mean, I think it's some big concerts, but it's been years. Like I don't go. I don't go to those very often. You know. Didn't you go um, see New Kids on the Block? What? Didn't you go see New Kids on the Block? Or yeah, like I went to like the I Heart the '80s, or maybe that was I Heart the '90s. The '80s one was better. The I Heart the '90s one was not very good. And it was kind of it was all these people like you think, and it was it wasn't the original artists, or it was just someone else from the band, and like it wasn't as good as as, it, as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I did just see Alice in Chains last week. They were really good. <laughs> you go a lot. <laughs> I do. You were like, oh, every other week. I'm like, yeah, that's about right. That's. <laughs> but I also, I seek it out, right? So that's, uh, it's not some, you can't, you can't just be passive on it. Because if you are, you won't have friends that go. And, and this is part of it is that some of my, a lot of my friends enjoy live music as well, right? Which is why we're friends because just like, you know, you have a lot of friends from working out. I have a lot of friends from music because that's what I love to do, right? And um, yeah, and, and we obviously all feel great after we hang out and watch a concert. 75% yeah. <laughs> better, actually. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, maybe more for you guys. But, but uh, yeah, so we'll wrap it up here, guys. So again, kind of thinking back to the, you know, this balance between cardio strength, skill, and then the play, you know, this kind of plays into that, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> the, 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 you know, the play aspect is, you know, things that you do, you do for, for fun. It could be competitive. It could be like a competitive softball league that you're part of, but it's, it's really more about uh, um, doing things beyond just trying to increase performance and these other metrics. You know, it's, it's the stuff that the other thing, you know, that at the end of it, you know, you're that you're having a good time. And one of the things that I'm always reminding people of is, is uh, for you coaches out there is I don't consider it a good class unless everybody's laughed at least two times. Right. So, so however you make that happen, whether you're, you're saying funny jokes or you're, you know, getting other people to, to help, you know, make things more fun, like in a, in a good, in a good fitness class, you want people laughing and having a good time. Right. And so you want to always be thinking about like, how can I make this, you know, more fun or can we, you know, how can we, how can we make sure people are not just, it's, it shouldn't feel like a second job, right? Which is, which is, I think the problem that a lot of CrossFit gyms run into is they start putting this sort of performance on the workouts and like being competitive and all that sort of thing. And it starts to be, it starts to feel like a second job and that's not a recipe for keeping people around for, for decades. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, uh, again, share, like, share, comment, subscribe, all the stuff that all the YouTubers always say. <laughs> um, but definitely share this with people that, that, that you think that they might find a benefit. And uh, um, I'll see you guys in the, uh, on the next podcast. Drive on. Drive on. <laughs> Drive on. Just say bye, Gigi. Bye, Gigi. Bye. Make fun of me because I thrive on. <laughs> bye, everybody. <laughs>